Dean Zelensky, how you doing? I'm doing fine, <laughs> Sean. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to see you. It's been a while. Thanks. Yeah, it's Good been a while. <laughs> so, okay, so I, I was trying to when I was uh, doing a little research and um, thinking a little bit about how we met it seems like we met met on a on a plane possibly i remember it was, it was definitely run a nam show but right i, most, I think most, most important people in my life i meet on a plane <laughs> but i i think i think we met on a plane though i think uh um maybe you were sitting a couple seats away not right beside me but like in like then and then like i was in one what is it row or whatever and you were in the next row or something and uh and then we just started talking and um and then i found out that you know you were you know who you were and i was just a saxophone player heading over to the to the nam show at that point right. and uh and then we managed to stay in touch um, uh, we, my wife and I came to, uh, Chicago and, uh, you were quite hospitable and, uh, you showed me some, uh, I guess a laser etching machine and a CNC machine. I think that you had in your, in your garage and, uh, and you had, uh, some various and sundry guitars, you know, around the house. And, uh, of course your wife is uh, lovely and very, very kind. And we had a, we had a wonderful time. Thanks again for that. Should we go out for pizza? We did. We did. <laughs> you got it. That's right. I think, it, and it seemed like it was between two different pizza places. And, um, and I think that, that, the, I can't remember the name of the, the pizza place we went to, but it was very tasty. I'm guessing Lou Malnati's. Yeah. It was pretty close to your house. It was like, it was like right down the street from your house. Yeah. yeah my, my wife would remember. I don't remember. <laughs> um, okay. So, so tell us, uh, tell us about yourself. Um, maybe how you, how you grew up, where you're from and what got you, uh, interested in guitars. I grew up in the Chicago suburbs. Um, when I was about 10 years old, I thought the guitar was the coolest thing on earth. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, my mother actually, my first guitar, my mother, there used to be a place called Marshall Fields, right? In Chicago which I shouldn't even be, have to talk that way, but you know, that was Marshall Fields was the big department stores. Eventually bought up by Macy's, which probably won't be around in the next six months either. But anyway, she, um, she got me an acoustic, they were taking down a display, store, a window display, and there was uh, an acoustic guitar in it. I think it had like one string or something and she bought it for a dollar. <laughs> and that was my first guitar when I was, 10 years old, but, um, then eventually I, um, I, I was taking guitar lessons and I saw a Gibson SG that was uh, this red SG. And I just thought that was the coolest thing on earth and had to have one. And I, don't know, I, just, I just fell in love with guitar. And, uh, I think, I think the monkeys were my big, my big, uh, inspiration at the time. <laughs> Now, um, did you take lessons on guitar? Yeah, I took lessons early um, when I was a kid. Um, I used to live in a town called Skokie. <laughs> uh, and I took lessons when I was, and I was only, I mean, I, was, I started playing guitar when I was 10. And I moved out, of, I moved when I was 12. So in that time, I took, I took lessons. <laughs> And then, yeah. and then I started getting back into life. Actually, you know what? I took lessons when I moved too. So we moved to Island Park 
And then um, I started taking lessons. Actually, one of my, my first guitar teacher when I went back into lessons was a guy named Paul Hamer, who owned a company called Hamer Guitars. Yeah. <laughs> so we both ended up being kind of well-known guitar builders. But uh, he was my guitar teacher for a time. Now, I, I don't think that I've heard you play guitar. I don't think I've, I've ever heard you play. We, our conversations have all just been about, um, I mean, just some of your designs and things. I mean, you were showing me some of the guitars around your house and, um, uh, you, you showed me when, when I was in your house, you showed me, it seemed like it was like in its early stages, the Z glide, the, the, uh, the, the neck, right. The sort of, uh, yeah. neck with the pattern on it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you probably caught me like between guitar companies. <laughs> I built three guitar companies mm. and I think you got me like between two and three, maybe. All right. I don't know. How long ago was that? Um, I, I think it was, uh, what was it? Uh, it must've been right after DBZ. Cause right. I think you were starting to make the, uh, I, I think it was right at the beginning of private label. Yeah, 2012, 2011, somewhere in there. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, but the Z-Glide was kind of cool. Um, I, you know, I was lasering a lot of guitars, mostly for decor, you know, but three, we were, my, well, my big thing was guitars were always 2D, and I always said, uh, you know, I wanted to do more with the third, you know, three dimension, you know, a lot mm. more carving. And then we started doing lasering. And one day I just got this, I, you know, I started, to, we did snakeskin on guitar, you know, snakeskin was a pretty popular guitar. And I, uh, I started thinking one day, well, what if I put a snakeskin on the neck and then the light went off, like, whoa, you know, I can texture necks and change the feel of them. And people sanded necks and did all sorts of things to necks to try to make them slicker and not so sticky like a lacquered neck. And I eventually came up with the Z glide, which was a way to reduce the friction of the neck and still give me a really a cool feel. It's it's interesting because I remember when when you were talking to me about it. Uh, so you you told me you, you were talking me through that you know guys sand the neck down, but then you can't protect the neck. You know you get moisture on it, then it can destroy the guitar. But with the Z glide, you can minimize the amount of like friction on the neck while still having some sort of lacquer to protect the wood. It's funny you should mention it because I happen to have a Z-Glide neck. There's a couple things about Z-Glide. First of all, it's a finished protected neck. So if you sand your neck and do stuff like that, it tend, you know, once you get the finish off, it takes on moisture quicker and releases moisture quicker. So your neck can move around. So that's not an ideal situation for a guitar neck. Um, the, the cool things about Z Glide is it's it's very textured, and mm. what we're doing is we redu re we're reducing the surface area of the neck. So you only touch in really twenty eight percent of the surface; the rest is air. Okay, mm. so your hand kind of just glides over because you're just not there's just not reduced friction. It's kind of the same concept as a golf ball with the dimples that travels farther because of the dimples in the golf ball. So um, that's a big part of it. But the other thing that's kind of cool is if you're sliding, you get reduced friction. But if you're depressing, you can get increased friction because of a smaller pressure point. Right. So when people want to do no bend notes and stuff and they got their thumb on the back, you actually pick up a little traction. Mm. And then when you're sliding, you lose traction. So it, it's kind of worked out to have you know, the best of both worlds. And if you notice, there's, there's two things going on. There's striations on the neck and there's depressions and the striations kind of do this moisture wicking thing. <laughs> so mm. you your hand like drier, like pretty much when people play guitar, their hands sweating. And that's always for two reasons. Number one is because you're usually on, on stage you're under lights, which are hot or two, cause you're nervous, <laughs> <laughs> but about 90% of guitar players pr probably hand is sweating when they're playing for one of those two reasons. Right. So it's, it really, it, it works well. That's all I can say. 
Uh, something else I noticed about these guitars, they have, uh, you have like some. Thank you so much for watching my video so far. If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. Uh, you have like some special pickups where uh, the, the the name the name of the pickups is is escaping me right now, but where the single coil uh, is at the same volume as the as the humbucker. And uh, can you talk uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, pretty much the original pickup we came out with is called the Sidekick. Sidekick, that was it. Uh, yeah, and the, and the concept of the sidekick is the one coil is a true single coil. Okay. Mm -hmm. The sidekick coil basically makes the single coil. That's because we call it, that's why it's called the sidekick, because it works with the other coil. And um, without getting into stuff I don't want to talk about, basically. It was the first pickup. I think other people maybe have worked on our technology. It was the first pickup, you know, in production that literally when you tap the pickup, not only do you not lose volume, but you really end up with a true single coil. Okay. Yeah. Not a hot wounded humbucker or something, you know, half of a uh, hot wounded hump. You got true single coil technology. So that was important because what was happening is a lot of people would buy my, we worked really hard to make really great single coils and anybody who picked up our, Tagliers back in like two two thousand. I'm sorry, when we first came out with them in um, you know 20, 2011, 2012, They just said the pickups sound great. Then people would start putting. Oh, I want a humbucker in the bridge because everybody wants that HS. Not everybody. A lot of people want that HS. That sound, and it bothered me that they're losing this single coil sound that it works on so hard. Mm. And that's when we came up with the, um, a friend of mine had the technology and I talked to him and I said, I said, uh, he never did it in a single coil. It was always humbucker. And I said, we really need to develop that in a single coil. So when you tap it, you get the true single coil. And that's what, that's when we came up with the sidekick, but it was kind of, um, born out of the fact that I was frustrated that people were losing the single coil sound when they put a humbucker in. So I, now I have it where you get a humbucker and you can have the true single coil sound. So now our most popular setup is really dual sidekicks where you can have single coils or humbuckers in either position. Yeah. And now we have the true tap pickup, which is based on the original concept of the humbucker design where you do get, um, you know, it's for a guitar that you would normally put humbuckers in, we put true taps in. And you get the same thing where the volume doesn't drop off with its tap, but the humbucker is really a really cool humbucker. So, yes, um, that's a lot of explanation. <laughs> no, 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 that's a, that's great. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, when I when I met you on that plane, I didn't play bass or guitar, mm -hmm. and I kept trying to think of ways that. Okay, how? What are some ways I can collaborate with this guy? Because it, I mean, it could be a great opportunity. It could be something unusual and stuff. And and uh, and in two thousand, must have been two thousand five. It must have been two thousand five. I started playing bass, and I've been playing guitar for about ten years now. Um, and so a lot of so I've become sort of like a, um, a, a sort of a gear nerd, you know, about guitars, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I have a little bit of that ailment where whatever the new thing is, that's the thing I'm really into, you know? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so lots of that. So all of that stuff is really interesting. I think the listeners will enjoy that too. Cool. Uh, so, um, one thing that was unusual, uh, back when you, uh, with Dean guitars is what you did with the NAM show. Um, just really, uh, you know, really like huge, you know, like 
in your face fireworks, you know, <laughs> not literal fireworks, but <laughs> you know, just dancing, just the dancing girls. Yeah. Yeah. Just making, you know, making a huge deal out of, out of the show, I think in a way that was until you started doing it, uh, was, uh, unprecedented. Can you talk a little bit about that? No, I, I think we were more like, have you ever seen the movie used cars? <laughs> we were, uh, I, I think I have. We kind of used that motif, but oh. I, think I did it. I might've done that even before the, the movie came out, but you got to understand where Nam the whole thing of NAM. NAM is a whole different thing today than it was in the in the seventies when I got involved. NAM was a band and orchestra. You know, it was all managed by band and orchestra people. And they just tolerated, you know, like guitar people, you know, but if you went to the NAM show it was it was all dominated by band which you're you know, you're a you're a band and orchestra guy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but um then we then I, we came in and we were the new generation of you know us rockers okay, and I guess we kind of lived up our, to our reputation because you know we were going to be louder and a little racier. So um, there was always the noise thing that we brought to Nam, but eventually we did. I, I started bringing you know we started using girls in our advertising, then we started bringing them to Nam. And uh, they weren't, it was, it was the eighties, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it was rock and roll. And we, we basically, I had to let people know my guitars were cool. Okay. And I always felt like I had to relate to my customers. So you kind of brought their world into my world, you know, the, 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 the rock and roll world into, you know, into our world. So we put on some pretty flashy shows. But it most it culminated uh, probably the breaking point with N and Nam. By the way, used to fight us tooth and nail and threaten to shut our booth down and do all sorts of stuff like that. But it culminated when I had this idea to do a fashion show. I had these girls coming out. You know, we built a runway on our stage and we had them coming out um, wearing, you know, something a little bit more than a bikini, and they're you know, but they're showing off the guitars. And it was literally run like a like a you know fashion show with the runway and the whole thing. We had an announcer and music running. And when we did our first, what we did is we had a clock. So pretty much we'd run our first show and then the, and the clock would say next show at one o'clock or whatever it was. We ran our first show, you know, runway show, which probably lasted eight or ten minutes or whatever it was, maybe fifteen minutes. And then we set the clock for the next hour. The second time we ran the show, our booth was swamped because the word got out what was going on at our booth. And literally, you can't go, couldn't get anywhere near our booth because it was just swamped with people watching our fashion show. Yeah. <laughs> and then Nam kind of freaked out, and they called me in the office, and they said, we have to shut you down, which they threatened me for other reasons. But I said, Why? And I said, because you're blocking the aisles. I said, we're within our booth. You know, I can't help it if my product's really hot. <laughs> well, everyone wants to get them. <laughs> 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 they really, they didn't really have a retort for that one. <laughs> and they let me go on. But anyways, yeah, we, but we really changed the face of the NAM show. And literally, you know, years later, you know, like I had, I had, um, guys would come by from NAMM who we, we all got friendly over time. And they'd say like, you know, Dean, you know, got to watch your volume and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, I said, you know, we made the NAMM show for you guys. Cause the NAMM show is huge now and everybody wants to go. And it's a big thing. I okay. said, us rockers made the NAMM show for you guys. You, you know, NAMM's got more money in the bank than maybe Apple. <laughs> mm. and, uh, and it was cause of what we brought. So, um, yeah. Okay. There's, there's a lot of other stories, but that was probably the biggest one. <laughs> the, the, the biggest, what do you call it? Disruption. Now, now this, there's a, a bit of a sub story in there, right? Cause, um, so how, how did you, how did you meet your wife? Well, we were hiring girls. Actually it's kind of weird. Cause my wife, um, we, we used to hire girls. So I used to work with modeling agencies a lot to hire the girls. I got friendly with the owner of one of the modeling agencies 
And she really kept trying to connect us. She kept saying, you should go out with Susie. Kept telling Susie, you should go out with Dean and keep doing it. And I had this lunch meeting with that lady like a few months before a NAMM show. And once again, she said, you really should go out with Susie. And I said, you know, I got a NAMM show coming up. You know, maybe I'll just hire her to work the NAMM show because <laughs> Susie was a Playboy centerfold. And, you know, it'd be cool to have a centerfold and just you know, sign autographs. So I booked Susie and then she ended up liking me. <laughs> we ended up liking <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was like, uh, that was like 35 years ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's how I, I did meet my wife through those channels. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty rock and roll, right? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's that's heavy, man. It got me to the Playboy Mansion. What can I say? <laughs> that's a it's a great story though, because uh, you know, with the way that dating is, and how sort of out of the way it kind of is. You know, you hear you often you hear these stories where, as you're just doing what you're called to do doing your job, doing what you love, doing what you're passionate about. You bump into certain other people that are kind of, they're along their path doing what they love to do also. And it works out. That's the same thing that happened with um, my wife and I were, um, we were both working at the same church basically. Um, and uh, she's a dancer and she was over the dance ministry and, and I was uh, in the band and writing music and stuff. And even before we knew each other, we had actually already collaborated on a project because she had done the choreo choreography and I had written the arrangements. So, you know, and wasn't really forcing it or trying. It's just, we're both in the same place. And, um, music is uh the, the music industry is a is not a nine to five job yeah. i i mentor a lot of kids by the way you know young kids who come in because they all want to either be in rock and roll and you know music or they want to be you know, young guitar builders and my basic line is nothing happens sitting at home on your couch <laughs> you know you got to put yourself out there and uh, when you put yourself out there, things happen, which could also mean you meet your wife, you know? Yeah. But um, yeah, you, you really, yeah. My, every time I've ever gotten on a plane and done something, something good's come out of it, you know what I mean? And uh, like I met you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, 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 Carl Carl Wallace. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and one thing, what, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. Uh, oh, do you think of yourself as more introverted or extroverted? I don't know. People tell me I'm funny. <laughs> no, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a very, uh, I always say I'm a simple man with a complicated brain. And uh, I think you got to be pretty smart to build a guitar company and mm. you know know all the know all the moving parts i mean i designed my own machinery my own tooling you know that kind of stuff when i was a kid mm. um so am i introvert or extrovert um I'm a passive extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, th so this, the, often it seems that uh, uh, I've asked this question a few times in this series. And one thing uh, that sometimes can help, uh, cause I had to sort of think of that for my, think of the same thing for myself. And that is, do I, is it energy depleting or is it energy? Is it invigorating when I'm around people that I total strangers, people that I don't know and people that I can't talk to, I can't shop, talk shop to, mm -hmm. you know? So if I had to go and talk about 
the most surface level, you know, aspects of the weather and just a bunch of stuff and never really get deep on anything. <laughs> would, would, would that make me invigorated or would I need a lot of sleep after that? <laughs> and for me, I would need a lot of sleep Yeah. for my wife who is an extrovert she's great oh yeah you know <laughs> she'd be having all kind of fun um, I, I think i could put myself in any situation and totally improvise and come up okay <laughs> huh. that's that, it's unusual that's unusual it's unusual because in order for you to be as good as you are as a guitar builder mm -hmm. you have to spend a lot of time by yourself right. you know oh, i'll tell you some things okay First of all, if you're a guitar builder, about 10%, or if you're like me, a, a guitar manufacturer, about 10% of your time is really involved with building guitars. You, there's so many other pieces to the puzzle you got to do. Right. But think of it, I was like 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, and I'm like building this guitar company with designing machinery and tooling and figuring out how to buff and spray. And this is before there was, there was no luthier schools. There was no luthier equipment there was nothing you know what i mean the only way i could figure out how to buff a guitar with you know was to infiltrate gibson and find out how they're doing it you know what i mean and i hit, I, was, I got the number of the back payphone at gibson phone number and i was able to call there and talk to people and ask them what the buffing compound what the name is on the bar of the buffing compound and they tell me stuts chicago and then i call get a phone book because you had to use phone books in those days and i call stuts in chicago and i said i need buffing compound i hear you make it for gibson what do i need same thing with lacquer i got my lacquer from mobile chemical because i found out they were using mobile chemical you know so that that's what i had to do on the inside okay but then at nighttime, I was taking my guitars and going backstage to rock bands, major rock bands, and hustling my guitars. So I'd have to go and meet, you know, rock bands and totally improvise. <laughs> I'd have to, and you know, how'd you meet a rock band in those days? Whatever band's coming to, let's say, like Heart is coming to town. I go get the album at the record store. I read the back of the record, and I say, okay, this is their management. This is their record company. They're all in New York or L.A., and I just started making, you know. And those days, you know, if you wanted a phone number for the record company, it was 555-121 or whatever area, area code they're in, you know, 1212, and you you know, and, and you called the record company and I worked my way back to, into concerts, you know, so you got to be pretty outgoing to get yeah. on the phone with record companies and tell them who you are and say, I know hearts in town and I want to come show them some guitars. And then I go backstage, you know, I'm probably 19, 20 years old at the time. And then I meet in rock bands and just totally winging it, selling them guitars. <laughs> so, so, and literally I had these two worlds. I had the mechanical world where I had to be highly, you know, sophisticated in manufacturing and, 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 you know, woodworking and all those skills. And then I had to have my people skills to go out and hustle guitars to rock bands and all the other things. I think my personality carried me a long way too, because I mean, even get machinery dealers to work with me and want to help me out and, you know, with, you know, you know, it was my personality that probably helped me a lot. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so I, 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 I the, the, there's nothing passive ab about it for me. Uh, I'm, I'm just an introvert. <laughs> you're, an amazing, people... you're an amazing, you're an amazing horn, well, uh, sax player. Thank did you. you spend all, did you spend your whole childhood in a room learning how to play the sax? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I started when I was six, yeah. and my dad was a great saxophone player, so I got about three lessons a week, three or four lessons a week, in an attentive ear on the practice room, um, which, uh, I mean, is about the you know best advantage that you can have if you want to do music for, for a living, you know, um, is to start early and to have a really great teacher. Right. Um, I don't know. That, I'm going to say this out loud, but I'm going to tell you people who don't know, I know 
on a one to 10, Sean Wallace is about a 15 when it comes to playing the sex. <laughs> well, I thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an introvert. And, and when we met on the plane, uh, you just, you, I think you talk, you spoke first and you just started, you know, talking and I felt comfortable instantly. And, uh, that's not necessarily what happens <laughs> when, you know, when I'm talking to people, but it was, it was cool because we had something in common right away. Um, I told you I could improvise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So it was just, uh, it was really, really great. So, okay. So I, I own a Dean guitars guitar. It's an exhibition. Um, acoustic It's an acoustic guitar an exhibition. And I remember telling you that I, uh, that, that I owned an acoustic or something and you guessed, you guessed what it was before I told you what the, what the name was, <laughs> you know, what the model was rather. Um, and I thought that was, uh, um, I, well, I mean, and cause, cause this was, cause this was years after, uh, I mean, after you weren't with Dean and Dean guitars anymore. Right. right. And, and it seemed like that model of guitar was, uh, I don't know if you were involved in designing that guitar or if you just knew about the guitar because, you know, but, uh, anyhow, it's hanging on the wall back there. You can't see it, but it's well, black. When I went back to work for my old company, mm -hmm. I, did a lot of, I wore a lot of hats. I designed guitars. <laughs> I, I, um, didn't put a, put together the whole, built a factory, put together the whole artist program, a bunch of stuff. And one of the things I used to do was go on trips and sell guitars. So, and it, it kind of kept me sharp, but, uh, my deals, I do three day trips and I book $60,000 in three days religiously. <laughs> um, and I do two, three day trips a month. So, but it, it kept me fresh, you know, you got to really put yourself out in the stores and talk to the dealers and, you know, see what the hell's going on. That, that keeps you, keeps you in the game. And, uh, so one, one thing I noticed about, uh, some of the Dean, uh, so, so, you know, you see like seven and eight string guitars, and like this. And I asked you about, uh, you know, extended range guitars with a uh, private label. And, uh, I mean, you told me that, that that's kind of not the, excuse me, that's kind of not the direction you wanted to go with private label guitars. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, just as sure numbers, as soon as you start putting extra strings on it, the market falls off greatly. Um, so then you're starting to get in the specialized area. So you could, there's so many things you can specialize in, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I started out Dean Guitars with flying Vs and Explorers and V-shaped heads, and as popular it is today or as cool as it is, or it was a push, Okay because I had a million people say, so I'd never buy that because of the headstock. You know, I want a round body guitar, blah, blah, blah. So I was ahead of the curve as far as that, but I was, you know, I say in business, sometimes you're pushing the cart uphill. <laughs> you know? And I was clearly put, you know, we did well. Okay. But you know, the ratios were like, okay, they sold one V, but they sold 15 less Paul's. Okay. The stores. Okay. In the same time period. And it's just the ratio of pointy, what we call pointy guitars today to round body guitars. Uh, when I went back to Dean from 2000 to 2008, the whole concept that was a broad line, a huge line. I mean, we had, if you wanted a lefty eight string bass, we had it, you know what I mean? Mm. Acoustic 
left whatever it was we just had this broad line of guitars and that's very heavy inventory lot you know and lower margins stuff it was when i started um dean Zelensky guitars my com my third company um it was really back to basics i wasn't i didn't start out as a metal i got kind of pigeonholed as a metal guitar builder because of dimebag daryl and ml and all that stuff but before Dimebag Daryl was playing in ML, I had the Doobie Brothers playing it. I did Billy Gibbons, ZZ Top. The whole Eliminator record was recorded with the Dean ML. Um, uh, Kerry Libyan of Kansas played an ML. Dimebag made it a metal guitar, and then everybody, you know, you know, turned away from it. All the conservative. But I really just wanted to go back to my roots. I really just wanted to make nice six-string guitars. It's a broad market. Uh, my customers kind of got old. I have a broad customer base, but my guys that were with me when I was 20 are with me, you know, and they're into their fifties, sixties and seventies. And it's, and it's a huge market. And they're all, they all got money. I shouldn't say this out loud because my competition might be watching, but they all got money and they love guitars. And, you know, this demographic is pretty cool because a lot of them get government checks they don't need they their their parent they're at an age where their parents money is passed down so they've got their inheritance and they have a lot of money and they have time there's two things people have need to um to enjoy guitar one is money and one is time <laughs> you know when people are raising kids they don't have any time as a rule don't have any money but you wouldn't believe how many people call me. I answer the phones a lot at my company now. I get on the I don't always answer, but I get on the phone a lot. I sometimes they answer the phone. And uh, I get a lot of 50, 60-year-old guys saying, I've always wanted to learn to play guitar, and I'm learning. And, I'm, and for some reason, they're picking up my guitar. <laughs> you know, They're not buying the Fender, the Gibson, which you think they just go to the you know, staple brands. But for some reason, they hunt me down and want to buy from me. They like my factory direct policy they like what i've done in my life and a, a lot of it's word of mouth you know i mean somebody has one of my guitars and says you got it my neck is huge the z-glide neck is huge my pickups are huge you know nobody's really put all that together so um anyways it's, it's a great demographic although you know i do have those people's kids buying my guitars and i do have a young you know younger crowd but um I guess my company day is really just back to basics of guitar building. And if I'm going to go into seven strings and eight strings and all that stuff, it, it really, we're just, we're, we're not, we're, it's just not our, you know, we're not trying to be something to everybody. We're really good at really great six string guitars. Our, my big thing is my guitars have a lot of versatility. You can have, you can have, you put two sidekicks, you can have five pickups on a guitar and get like tones all on boarded and they're all meaningful tones. It's not like those things where they put these burial buttons on and get 20 tones that nobody gives a shit about. Yeah. This is like real meaningful, real single coils, real humbuckers and real combinations. So my thing is I can onboard a lot of tones and a lot of weekend warriors, they want to, they just want to, you know, they go out and gig and they want to show up with one guitar. They can do a lot. Yeah. Like my Labauche guitar, it has a acoustic, you know, piezo pickup. It's got single coils and humbuckers, but it looks like no different than a Les Paul. It's got two, you see, all you see is two humbuckers and four knobs, but it does all this stuff under the hood. It's like, it's like if, uh, the muscle car days, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, the, you, you got a um, 426 Hemi under the hood, but it looks like your mom's car. I've been secretly pining over that guitar. <laughs> I guess I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, no. That's the, uh, that is, uh, th th that's the one <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm saving my bottle caps. Cool. Cool. S&H green stamps. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. You ever hear of S&H green stamps? Uh, uh, no, you have to be about, 60 <laughs> to know but in the old days you go to a gas station and you buy gas and if you buy how much so much gas they give you these green stamps and you'd fill up mm -hmm. these books and then you can go redeem them 
at uh, the SNH Green Stamp Store. <laughs> so, um, I mean, so you're. If you read, by the way, if you read one, I have a blog on my website. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about my early days and it talks about there's there's a, a story about my s and h green stamps <laughs> I, well, I, was saving, I, mean, I was saving up for a guitar with s and h green stamps when i was a kid yeah i mean yeah i mean you could you could you you could uh uh go into more detail about that if you'd like to right now well this is a short story is i was saving up for a guitar. They had a four pickup Tysco Del Rey, and I wanted this guitar in the worst way. And you had to get all these books and these green stamps, like you get like your grandparents. You had to ask for their green stamps. You literally had to lick the stamps and put them in the books. And you <laughs> Fifty books or something. It was a what do you call it? it was a coupon program. You know, I to, see. you know, and then sent them to shop at certain stores because they gave you a lot of green stamps. It was old technology before <laughs> the computer. But anyways, I'm saving and I'm saving for this guitar and Christmas time comes around and I decided to buy my father a drill instead. So I bought him a black and decker drill um, with my SD screen stamps instead of the guitar. And when I first started Dean Guitars, we couldn't get this buffing machine going. We had a buff guitar, so I literally clamped the drill to a table and put a buffing pad on it. We were buffing guitars with this drill with the with the trigger locked on it, you know. And I don't know how it lasted like forever, and eventually eventually burnt out. But the 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 um, the story is it was my father died by the way, and I ended up with the drill. <laughs> he died when I was twelve. So. Um, Anyways, the, the story was that I was saving up for this guitar with my s and cream steps, bought my father a drill, which ended up saving my guitar company at the beginning. So, so okay, so so uh, so when you were a kid, I mean, I mean, were was your dad a guitar player or something or were there other folks in that were close to the family or something that play guitar? And my father was about as unmusical as you get. You know, he was a, he, he had a screw machine factory, but he was a pilot. He was a, his own, he was at his own plane. He was really into flying. Mm -hmm. And my father, one day we're at home, you know, but he'd always buy gadgets and stuff. And he, we had a really nice stereo, you know, the console in the old days where it was all wood and record plays. And one day the Beatles record was playing. He literally went out and bought a Beatles film and played the Beatles. And that was like cutting edge for him. Um, so no, there wasn't no music, but my brothers and I were all musical. My, my mother, I should say, my mother majored in music and mm -hmm. played piano and sang and went to DePaul university and major in music. So I guess we were somewhat musical, but it wasn't like a big thing in our house, you know, at all mm -hmm. until we started playing. But then we started, my brothers, my brother played drums. We started trying to have a rock band and stuff like that. And, but I would tell you something, my father, I wanted to grow my hair long, like the Beatles. My father would have nothing or the monkeys or whatever, you know, I was a little younger. So the monkeys were more my age group, you know, um, if you were, if you were like three, four years older, you were in the Beatles, you know, anyways, I wanted to grow my hair like the monkeys. And my father used to like take me to the, I mean, literally he died when I was 12. So I'm under 12 when this was going on, but he like take me to the barber shop, like pull me out of my bedroom and I would be clinging onto the door moldings crying, you know, cause I wanted long hair, like, like the monkeys. And I'd be sitting in the barber chair crying and they'd be cutting my hair and give me the butch wax. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, then my father died. I probably started growing my hair longer. So. Mm. Yeah. I, I, uh, I anyways, I he, he, excuse me. He wanted no part of that. Me being, you know, a monkey. And actually, I do have an epiphany of a story about that if you want to hear it. But. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Anyways, so 
uh, he wanted me, a, me to be a businessman. I wanted to be a guitar guy. Hmm. So he flew and he literally told, he was flying. He flew into, he used to go to Texas a lot in his plane. And he goes in and, and he comes back and he tells me a story. Yeah, the monkeys were just in there. They, you know, the monkeys flew in in a Lear jet. So it took him a week to defumigate the plane. He goes, these guys are pigs. You know, it was, it was the whole story about the monkeys and about the haircut and about my father wanted me to be a businessman and I wanted to be a rocker. Anyways, years later, I meet Peter Tork, who was in the monkeys. And I said, you know, Peter, I said, I think if it weren't for the monkeys, there wouldn't be a Dean guitars. And then I told him the story about my father and about the, you know, hanging onto the door moldings, wanting, you know, while he's taking me to, taking me to the barber shop. Then I tell him the story about the Learjet, you know, and it smelled like, so he goes, yeah, he goes, we're smoking pot in those days. Nobody even knew what it was. So when they said they're fumigating the plane, they were just trying to get the smell of the pot out of the plane. <laughs> like, this is in the sixties. Okay. My father died in 69. So anyway, so Peter asked me, he goes, well, he goes, well, no, he, I didn't, he didn't know my father, you know, got killed in a plane crash when, when I was young. So he said, well, what did your father think of your guitar company or your, you know, what you ultimately did? And I said, you know what? He died young. So he never saw what I did, but come to think of it, I became a businessman like you wanted. I just did it in the rock and roll business. And it was the first time I really connected those dots that my father wanted me to be a businessman. I want to be a rocker and all the things that went on when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old and how it played out, you know, until I had that conversation with Peter Tork, it was like an epiphany for me. Yeah. Yeah, man. And now um, Peter Tork was gone. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, uh, it, it, it seems like there's been a lot of, uh, Okay. So because of the pandemic, uh, okay. So it seems like equal parts people dying and not because they got COVID, but just because it was maybe it, it was just time. Um, and then people dying from COVID, but then because of the quarantining, these sort of like unceremonious, you know, unceremoniously passing away and not being able to like be at the funeral or, you know, and, you know, you know, that just even, even the idea of like, okay, I'm live streaming the funeral, you know, that it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem right. So even if the technology is available, it's like, <clears throat> it's just a lot of this happening, especially in the, uh, this has definitely been the case in the jazz community. A lot of great jazz artists have passed away recently. Um, uh, for instance, Chick Corea just passed away. Um, and now that was not COVID related. Um, he had cancer. Um, but a lot of people weren't getting treated well during COVID either because, right. You know, and they're not, you know, nobody's rushing to the hospital right now for anything unless they absolutely have to. Right. Right. So I'm sure certain kinds of checkups that could be preventative, right. you know, a lot of folks are not getting those. Right. And uh, we don't know what that's going to do, but yeah, that's been, that's been a real, a real, uh, a real drag, a real, you know, just really unfortunate, um, sort of byproduct, I suppose you would call it of this whole quarantining thing, mm -hmm. um, is just not being able to, uh, be present for, you know, funerals. I'm, you know, there's been even just in the, in my immediate community here, Columbus, there's been a lot of people that have passed away. This guy, uh, that, um, um, David Strauss, that's his name really, it's still, I mean, he's in his fifties when he died. Uh, he was basically single-handedly bankrolling live music 
uh, at a venue that he had spent like his own money to, to, to resurrect. Uh, and so I was playing there once a month, a bunch of bands were playing there. Um, and he wasn't making any money. He was live streaming the gig and nobody was showing up because, you know, it's like, you know, it's like quarantined and everything. And, uh, and then he just, they just, they found him in his house, you know? Uh, and then, you know, he had his, his funeral and stuff, but you know, it's, it's only a few people can come, uh, because of the pandemic and everything, man, I'll just be so happy when this, this stuff is over. And I, but I, I don't know, I don't know if it's ever going to be like it was before, you know, for live music, for, uh, for anything. I mean, I go to a guitar center and it's like, they only have like, they can only keep, keep about half of the usual stock that the inventory that they have in there, you know, it's like a, um, and I always, and I asked them and say, you know, how's, you know, how are sales, how's things going? And they were like, oh yeah, we're selling a lot of guitars. And so we just can't keep any stock, you know, well, so logistics, logistics have been terrible during this thing. I mean, I can sell two, three times what I can produce right now. So I told you two things that people need, you know, the, for the guitar business, time and money. And one thing people have a lot during the COVID crisis was time and money. Not everyone had money, but I'm just saying people had money and money. And then there was a lot of some of the stimulus when the stimulus checks first started hitting, I think they were all spending them with me. Uh, but you can't, we import a lot of things. We manufacture things. It's just hard as hell to get it. The freight costs are outrageous. Um, it's, you know, our, our, one of our factories overseas was, you know, everyone was shut down. And then when things started to open up, you're running at 25% capacity, 50% capacity. The only thing we buy out of China, by the way, are guitar cases. They couldn't, there's so much stuff coming out of China. We, we couldn't get any cases on the, on the first time I've been importing things. I've been manufacturing since 76 I started importing out of Japan in, in um, 90, 1993 or 94. I'm sorry, 83, 84. Yeah. Um, early 80s, I started, or 84, I started importing. So I've been importing stuff for a long time. I've imported from, from, Japan, Korea, China, India, Indonesia. Um, it's the first time I, I had to wait a month to get guitar cases on a ship because they're, they're just so backed up there. That's how much stuff is coming in from China right now. Um, so, yeah, logistics have been a real problem. And work ethic's been a problem, too. <laughs> People just don't want to work. The, 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 the mood is such that it's hard to, it's, it's just hard to people get motivated to work. Mm. So, so, you know, I, uh, what, one question I had is about, um, innovation. So do you have some sort of experimental things in the works uh you know maybe you can't talk with any specificity about them but um you have anything uh you know new that you're about to release well i always have ideas that i want to get to okay right so and the, the, the big question is, am I getting to any of them? And the answer is no, we're just so busy. I'm literally, I can build guitar. I mean, I, I can build every, I can do every aspect of what, I, of my company, everything from photography, web design, graphic art, building guitars, programming machine. I, I, there's no part of my company I cannot do. Okay. Which is pretty rare, I think. But for the first time in my life, I've been literally in the shop 24, you know, the whole time. I mean, the bigger task in my, all my years has really been 
management um, and marketing. You know, guitar building is just what I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but right. but to run a business, you you don't get. And since COVID, I've been. First of all, I, we don't need any marketing. The guitars, the orders just keep coming in. So I, I really I cut our marketing budget. Um, we're not doing, we're doing very little, you know, like web development and you know, thing like we're just maintaining, but our whole thing is just trying to get, get guitars built and out the door. And that's kept me in the shop 24 seven. And you've I, kept your, and you've kept your prices the same. Well, we've had a little bump. Um, just because the logistics are just through the road. Right. Um, but um, cost, uh, even getting the delays and stuff like that, we're just doing a dance every day to try to keep all the balls in the air. We're doing okay, but it's not without a lot of effort. You know, one, one thing I, I noticed, uh, so, you know, I, I started my this interview series and you are episode 122. Cool. <laughs> um, and I started this in March. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bottom fell out. <laughs> you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. All, all of the gigs dried up and everything else. And it just dawned on me, hey, you know, I've been wanting to do a podcast, you know, um, this is my opportunity to do it because it's not like people are doing anything, especially for the first few months, it was like not a lot of stuff happening. And, uh, it kind of has grown and developed from there. But, uh, one thing I noticed, you know, I was, I was asking you about your, your pricing. Oh, you know, one thing that happened is like webcams or anything that was, you know, was, was necessary to doing, doing like zoom meetings or any kind of online, anything they were gouging like crazy, right. all kind of crazy. I mean, four times, five times, six times the price people were uh, selling old stuff on eBay for four times the new price. Yeah. You know, it was just cra craziness. And, uh, um, yeah. I will so. tell you my, my, my customers are not price sensitive. Um, like we put out, we have, you know, the guitar is 900, but you can add this, this, and this, and get it up to 1500 or whatever, you know, with a lot of options and then uh, they, pile, they load them up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, they're just not price sensitive at all. It's, um, they want to spend more money on a guitar and get more guitar. So I'm, well, I think a lot, of, a lot of that has to do with uh, how great your guitars are, right? I mean, they wouldn't be spending that money if they, if the guitars weren't like the, you know. They still think they're stealing them. But when I started this company, we were putting, listen, I'm Dean. I'm obviously a notorious guitar maker for many years. I, when I started this company, it was still a lot of push because it's a new brand. Okay. And one thing about my brand, this was a hundred percent online. So nobody could, could touch it, feel it. Um, I'm talking, going back to 2012 when I started this company and it was still an uphill push for quite a while, you know what I mean? To get the brand out there. Um, our big thing was the Z glide neck and nobody could feel it, you know, because you can't, you can't feel anything on the internet. We're right, right. <laughs> Almost everything you can buy, you can go in a store online. You can go in a store and try it, but my brand, you can't. And so everybody who bought the guitar had to have, take a leap of faith. They had to believe in me, had to believe in what I'm saying, you know, and, um, you know, visually had to like what, what we're doing. Um, but it was still an, uh, pushing a cart uphill for a while before we really got some traction with all my, all the assets I had behind me from my 40 something years of doing this. Um, so I want, I, I can't imagine what it's like for all these young people, you know, you know, trying to start out in these guitar companies who had no traction and no track record and no rock. You know, I, I, I've had a history of many rock stars playing my guitars and, 
people that bought a ton of my guitars over the years that like, I'm kind of known for quality. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, if I build guitars in a factory overseas, you know, back in the day, everyone would follow me and all my other competitors would follow me in there. You know, I started building guitars in the court factory in the eighties and Fender followed me in there. A BC, every major guitar, uh, Kramer, everybody who was happening followed me into the court factory. <laughs> so, um, because, because they know if they can build for me, they can build for them. Right. So anyways, what I'm saying, it was still now things are, you know, things are, are, um, are very smooth as far as, you know, sales come in and, you know, the, the phone rings or the computer, you know, the, they're all online and the, and the you know, computer just dings and orders come in. But it was, um, even with all my, my equity, um, mm -hmm. brand equity over the years, it was still, it's still hard to push a new brand. You know. So of the say newer brands of guitars that are out right now, Mm -hmm. what are some guitars guitar manufacturers that um i'm sure you're looking at what other companies are doing that have some some maybe interesting designs or you think that are making good guitars right now actually i don't i don't pay that much attention <laughs> first of all i don't have time um you know it's funny I, i'm on uh, instagram a lot okay and there's dudes I, f I I follow dudes who like post up other people's stuff. Okay. And that's all they do is post other people's guitars. So I see a lot of guitars just, you know, scrolling through Instagram. I see some stuff that's cool, but they're always by builders that are, you know, have no traction usually, you know, and there's a ton of them I, with, with now you could buy a CNC machine for about five, $6,000, you know, home, home CNC machine. Um, and, you know, a lot of people can do garage operations. I guess it's like a lot of industries like recording and stuff like that, where people, you know, or photography or a lot of stuff that used to have to go to professionals for, you can do affordably on your own. So that opened up the world for a lot of guitar builders. There's uh, support like websites where you can buy fret wire and all these the things that were hard to find for us way back in the day. And it's real easy to get in the guitar business. The problem is it's hard to get traction guitar companies are, you know, they're really based on who is playing them, you know, rock stars, you know, built, you know, people bought what they saw and uh, there's no new rock stars being created. You know, they're all long in the tooth and there's no guitar idols. I mean, we had, you know, like, you know, first you had the Jimmy Page and uh, Jeff Becks and that was one, you know, that's where Gibson and Fender got all their traction. And then the next wave was, um, it's like the Eddie Van Halen came around and that wave and then the dime bag. And, and this, you had these guys every 10 or 12 years, you had a new, you know, great rock star, you know, showing it's like Eddie Van Halen. He changed right. everything. Right. And who, and who also passed away not that long ago. Right. By the way, you can't, I, I shouldn't leave out Jimi Hendrix, who was probably the Eddie Van Halen of, of, you know, the first wave. But there were all these guys that came around and they kept just stoking the industry, stoking the business, you know what I mean? And then there was all the, like when you had Eddie Van Halen, then you got all the other guys like Steve Vai and all the, yeah. you know, that genre. And then the dime bag and then all the metal guys, you know, that came around that changed things. And all that's gone. <laughs> I mean, they're not gone. I'm saying that doesn't happen anymore. And, you know, you record, think of record companies made rock stars. I don't, it's much as bad as record companies were and they were really kind of evil and they fucked a lot of people. That was the, what made rock bands. Cause they would front, the, they'd find a band, they'd front the money and they give the band that's shot. You know what I mean? And right. they could put them on tour and back them up. And, and that, you know, there was, there was a machine. They plugged it into the machine. The rock band found the, the record company found the band they front them the money. They made the record. They got them on tour with somebody else so they could get, you know, with a bigger band backing up so they could get the notoriety. And, and they just had a, a, what do you call it? A, like a hit machine. And oh, yeah. that's what I lived off of because I would sell like ZZ Top 
you know, I, I I got Billy Gibbons playing. I'd be at the ZZ Top show. But while ZZ, while Billy Gibbons is on stage, I'm not watching Billy Gibbons. I'm backstage hustling whatever other band <laughs> was opening <laughs> for. That guy's going to be headlining someday. Then after the show, I got a bullshit Billy and said, hey, you guys were great when I was only out there for one song, but I was back there, you know, hustling more bands, you know? Right. But that was the machine, and, and it was all based on record sales. People didn't make money on tours. The, the, they, they, they lost money on tours, but they put on these incredible shows, and it was all about because they made their money on airplay and records, you know, record sales. And that's all gone. So you can't really make rock bands. Like, you know, the only ones that are made are these ones that are made on like TV, uh, American Idol or, you know, that kind yeah. of manufactured shit. Yep. But anyways. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, so one thing I was going to ask you about is uh, Tosa Nabasi. Oh. You familiar with Tosa Nabasi? No. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's he's a terrific uh, guitarist. Um, uh, he he he's in a band called Animals as Leaders. It's a um, it's a progressive, uh, you know, progressive metal. Um, but it's about the 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 slickest progressive metal that you've ever heard. By the way, um, I'm working on a line of guitars for progressive metal. <laughs> oh really yeah. okay that's kind of something we have in the works okay yeah yeah um now he's he's he, so the band animals as leaders it's it's three people two guys that are playing on eight string guitars and then the, a drummer and then they play with like sequences and stuff mm -hmm. but you know they've lighting and with the shows and stuff and so anyhow tosin has his own company uh, abasi guitars mm -hmm. oh i know and, i know that yeah there was a big scandal with those guys oh really yeah oh no i, did, I didn't know about that look look it up because I've, I've heard yeah i've heard about that guy okay um but about, anyhow with the, with the guitar company something went went south oh yeah. um in any anyhow he's he's a great player but yeah I, I he's uh it's very it's very it's very different you can you can hear the the roots the the rock roots in what he's playing and it's you know overdriven and in all of that but uh, it's very unusual. It's a different kind of thing. He's got some interesting concepts, this selective picking concept. And um, Victor Wooten, uh, uh, the great bass player, um, he's uh, Tosin has basically borrowed Victor's double thumbing uh, technique and incorporated that with... Uh, selective picking and some of this other stuff that he does. It's, it's, he's incredible. I think I, he's, he's worth knowing, um, uh, put it that way, but, and, uh, he's done some stuff with Steve Vai and you know, that, uh, what is that, that, that guitar thing that, uh, that they put on was a G three or G five or whatever, whatever the thing is. Uh, and it's like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and, and then they'll have like another there's always three of them, but they're, they're sometimes different. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyhow, Tosin was one of them mm -hmm. for, I think the last time they did it. All right. Well, uh, you, you, you said something about just the record industry and how it's changed and, you know, you can't make any money on the road. And now the way that the stuff is, is switched is that because you can't make any money from records sales <laughs> because of how that's changed. Now it's like the only way to make money is on the road, right. which is like backwards. Right. Which is, yeah. you should be able to make money live concert, but in the old days, you know, concert was eight bucks. <laughs> you know, they didn't right. charge a lot to go see a show. But, you know, in the meantime, Frank Sinatra, who knows what kind of money he was getting back, you know, right. but, um, but yeah, no, I think nowadays tickets cost a lot of money. People go see the tickets, t-shirts are a fortune. The venues are taking a cut of the t-shirt money too, you know, um, uh, but you gotta be big to do that. And 
the only way you can get big is because you were old and you did it before, but it's hard right. for fans to break. You can't break out. You can't put on a good show. It costs a lot of money to put on a laser light show and all that stuff. And you can't yeah. build your, your, your brand without money. And the money used to come from the record companies and all that, the front money. And now there's no path. Yeah. And, and let alone uh, how things will likely maybe never be the same after this, this pandemic is over, because I think uh, we know how sort of vulnerable we are to this kind of, I mean, something like this was going to happen. Can I, I say mean, something? Go ahead. America's fucked up. Okay. Look what's going yeah. on in Texas. Okay. We have, they've given money and I, I don't want to get into politics, but they've given the rich people all the money in the world and they got all the money in the world, no money for infrastructure, no money for uh, the country starved. I always said if, if, if money was water, we'd all be thirsty. Um, mm -hmm. This country is messed up. It needs a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of TLC. Uh, the debt from this pandemic is, is outrageous. It was mismanaged. Everything, it's just a mess, okay? And they, every administration, oh, we're going to work on infrastructure. How do you work on infrastructure when you're $20 trillion in debt? And every dime after they spend the money in the military and, uh, and, and what do you call it, uh, you know, Social Security, Medicare, every dime after that is borrowed. So where are you going to get money for anything? You know, they just talk, talk, talk. They get elected. They can't do anything. Our country's broke and nobody wants to admit it. It just writes bad checks and writes bad checks and, and doesn't take care of. And, and our people in this country are, are not doing well. Okay. And it's, yeah. and it's glossed over. And now we're going to trillions of dollars are going to be spent shoring up everything. And, uh, you know, let's stick a fork in it. It's done. You know, the, this, I don't. So all these things, you get on an airplane in America, you're packed in, your laptop's up to your neck. That doesn't happen in other countries. I fly in Indonesia. I fly in other, you, you got room on the planes, coach, they're serving you wine. That doesn't happen, you know, in America. Okay. It's so much money has been funneled to the wealthiest people. I mean, and they won't raise minimum wage to $15 an hour. If you can't pay your people $15 an hour, you probably shouldn't be in business. You know what I mean? Um, that's such a big deal to give people $15 an hour, you know, in America. It's ridiculous. If we're as great as we say we are, then everybody should make, should be able to get paid $15 an hour. And if someone makes $15 an hour, guess what? They don't have to eat at McDonald's. Well, they probably still have to eat at McDonald's, but McDonald's workers can only eat at McDonald's. Walmart workers can only shop at Walmart. You know what I mean? And everybody's straight. And then the, 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 the go see a, 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 a baseball game costs you, you know, 900 bucks or whatever, you know, and rich yeah. people are going. It's so upside down. And like I said, the reason we're all cramped on an airplane is because the rich people got all the money. A seat on an airplane is minimum $500, but nobody's got $500 to go make that trip. They got two fifty. dollars okay? So the airline says, okay, we'll give you two fifty dollars of room, okay? Because nobody's got $500. They got to give you that room costs two fifty. dollars But the rich people got all this trillions, billions, you know, and nobody's got the $500 for the plane ticket. So everybody's sitting there scrunched on a plane and tolerating it. So, yeah, you know, stuff. Did, is... I, get, did I get on a tangent here? Oh, no, no. That's, that's totally fine, man. And Texas, I mean, look at Texas, uh, privatize the, the thing. So, Oh, we don't, we'll put the money in our pocket. We don't know. Okay. Now there's a disaster. People are dying. Their homes are, who's going to pay for this? FEMA's coming in, government, you know, the privatized in, uh, privatized utilities, but our government's going to come in and bail them out. The insurance companies are going to bail them out. Where does the insurance companies get their money? They raise everybody's rates. Everybody's going to pay for their 
privatized system. Okay. No. Who, who didn't have to maintain anything. You know why? Because when the shit hits the fan, the government comes in and takes care of everything. Yeah. So that's, that's what's going on in America. And I sell guitars. I need, I mean, I talk about my customer base and they're doing well or the, whatever they get government checks. Or what, but bottom line is I need people to have money to, to buy my guitars. Okay. And it's not personally right. about me. My, my FedEx driver, my UPS driver, it's going to make over a hundred grand, you know, this year. Okay. Like 120, he told me, uh, an Amazon driver is going to make 30. I can't sell a guitar to an Amazon driver. I can sell it to a UPS driver. Okay. I don't want Amazon to be successful because if they're successful, I can't sell them any guitars, but I can sell them. I got, you know, UPS, I want to be, you know, I want them to succeed because I can sell them people guitars. It's, it's not about me. I'm just making a, a no, no, no. I, I, I everybody, everybody profits when people make money. It seems they, they become that, consumers. Well, it seems like there would be uh, some sort of uh, advantage to a brick and mortar store because of what you said earlier about, you know, you can't feel the Z glide neck online, <laughs> right? You, you can't reach through the, the monitor, you know, the, to, 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 to feel it, but to be able to actually go into a store, sit down, plug the guitar in, you know, and, and play and then say, okay, yeah, this is what I want as opposed to sort of guessing at it. Right. Um, it seems like that would be an advantage. Um, what Amazon has done is by becoming as efficient as they have at the, at the shipping thing, um, they've made, I, I, it's, it, there's gotta be a way to shift this thing back to, you gotta go to the store to buy, to buy this item, you know, otherwise it seems like Amazon is going to win. I mean, well, it, they've already won stores. <laughs> Stores need margin, okay, because they got overhead, okay? Right. Okay. Um, on, online, you can do volume, okay, whatever, but stores need margin. Once you got online, stores no longer work because the stores can't get the margin, okay? You buy something for a buck and you need two bucks for it, Amazon says, well, you're only going to get a buck 30, okay? So there's no, there's no longer you can't have a store. Okay. And that's what Amazon did. There were three camera stores within five minutes of my home. Now there's none. Okay. We're doing a shoot one day. We need a better tripod, um, you know, to study the camera. There used to be three, three stores out. I could run out in 10 minutes and come back with a tripod. They're all gone. I have to order it from Amazon and wait two days. Okay. The shoot's done now. We can't do the shoot that day. You know what I mean? Um, these are the things that Amazon, you know, and so bottom line is brick and mortar cannot survive in that environment because there's no way they can get the margin. So, how, so what has to happen to change that? What do you think can happen as far as maybe some policy or what, what can happen? I mean, other than saying something like, well, Amazon is just going to have to <laughs> cease and desist so that everybody else can. Well, for I mean, one thing, they could, they could start do? paying, they could start paying taxes and then just help out the infrastructure. How, okay. Okay, how that can but change. Even if they do that, they're making so much money. Even if they did that, they could still continue. And no, the, the, be... no, I, that, that, I'm, a, I'm on a tangent there. No, yeah, yeah. I, you know, that, that ship's left the station, you know, or whatever, you know, I don't okay. think dead ship sale. I don't know you, if that you can, you can put that back in the bag now. Um, cause yeah. everybody's got to take, and I got to, uh, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody, but you know what, when, when I'm at my shop, it used to be when you need something, you made a list and then you went to the store. So we need 1000 grit sandpaper in a roll. I go on Amazon and order it. I get my buffing compound through Amazon just mm -hmm. because they sell it and it's just easy. You know what I mean? It's, it's so no. easy. It's ridiculous. I don't have to call 
my buffing compound company and, you know, and get, a, you know, it's just like you go to your app, you bought it before you hit buy it again and it shows up the next day. You know what I mean? We're yeah. buying switches and, and I, and I don't like it, but I need the convenience now because of the state we're in where we just don't have the personnel to do anything. So right. literally my uh, dude, you know, one of my guys says, Hey Dean, we need, uh, our, we need uh three way switches, whatever, um, you know, whatever switches we use. And I just go on the Amazon app, mm. you know, and hit buy again. I don't have to look it up. I don't have to do anything. You know what I mean? It's just so easy. So yeah. it's, it's really a brilliant way to shop for a lot of things. The problem is, I don't know how I'm ever going to buy a suit again because all the department stores are out of, out of, there's a big mall by my house. I live in a pretty wealthy neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Even Marcus Macy's and Lord and Taylor all closed. Those are the three anchors. The fourth big thing in the building is, um, is AMC theaters, which who knows if they're going to make it. Okay. So now you've got malls always had three big anchor stores or two big anchor stores. And then at a bunch of little shops, the anchors are gone. They knocked down Macy's the buildings. They knocked down that part of the mall. And this is a fancy mall. You know what I mean? Marble floors, the whole nine yards, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, in the North suburbs of Chicago, you know? So, um, I don't know what, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 it's <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I, I kind of, I, so I feel, I feel the same way about, um, you know, this, that whole, the sort of, you know, stick a fork in it that that's done. It's never going to go back. You can't get it back in the bag. Like you said, um, you know, with the, with the record industry, right. So the streaming, everything is streaming. Terrible. Everyone has access to all music and all recorded history, you know, and 99.999% of it for free. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> what our Spotify bill is or whatever, but mm -hmm. anything I want to listen to, I pull up my phone in like 10 seconds. Right. I, I can't, so, so I'm, not paying, I'm not paying, I'm not buying an album a month. <laughs> Yeah. So, so how and it's so, a family. I mean, I'm using it. My kids are using it. Um, I don't know. Maybe even one of my kids are paying the bill. I don't even know how much it is, but, or maybe, you know, I don't see our, my wife pays all the bills, but, but I'm just saying, you know, if you, if you were buying records, you'd spend 80 bucks a month. <laughs> mm -hmm. but we have a family of five and who knows how many friends are, each, you know what I mean? So no, there's no money there. Yeah. So then it goes back to the, the touring thing, but then that's, you know, slim to none. And then the big, then the big loss, is, huh? the big loss is if, if artists can't make money, then there's no artists. Yeah. Well, the, you can just or get the, on American Idol, right? I mean, there could be an artist, but nobody will hear them or know about them. <laughs> right. And, 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 and that's, that's a real reality. Right. So we have, so one thing that record companies provided, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, um, was a, a sort of qualitative control of all of the stuff that was coming out, right? It had a certain sound, there was a certain quality standard. Mm -hmm. And so if, Columbia put a record out, you knew that it was going to be within a certain, a certain range. Mm -hmm. And now the, the benefit of the gatekeeper is it keeps that sort of whatever that standard is. Mm -hmm. The negative of the gatekeeper is probably there was a lot of people that couldn't get a shot because, you know, because Columbia was going to spend all their money on this short list of artists. Okay. So you probably had that now, now everyone has home studios and, and has the technology to be able to produce everything and then even direct release stuff, right. Put it on YouTube, put it on, you know, Spotify, put it on SoundCloud, whatever. So there's a lot more stuff, right. but the quality of the stuff is all over the place. Well, not right. only that, how do you get on people's radar? 
And then also, even if the quality is really good, right. how, how you, 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 you can't, you can't make a, make a dent. When this first started, you know, with the file sharing of records and, you know, everything. Napster. Like yeah. <laughs> I, I was out with a record company executive and he told me, he goes, Dean, remember when you, you know, not so long ago, you'd go to a music stand. I'm in a magazine stand and the rack was four feet wide, four feet mm -hmm. wide. And every magazine in the world was on that rack. And then a few years later, you go to Barnes and Noble and it's two fucking aisles of, of, of magazines. Okay. And the same people are coming to buy, but they're buying now all those magazines. So that's the record business. You know, it's a lot of bands selling nothing compared to that forfeit rack, you know, where everything's happening. Yeah. And that's what, but you can't, you know, how do you, you know, a, a million bands can't have platinum records, you know, <laughs> right. which means that many people are not hearing them. But when you talk about the genre, you know, I used to shop record deals back in the day, probably in the eighties. Um, you know, I'd find a band, local band and shop the deal. I had a band, they were out of Atlanta. Everybody but I mean, the singer was this cute blonde dude with a five octave range, you know, and this keyboard player wrote songs that were hits and it was just an amazing band. Okay. And anyone would say this is a signable band. And I had like the head, I had one of the A&R guys come out and see the band and said, I want to sign them, but I got to bring my boss out there. Okay. So the chili peppers had just broken the red hot chili peppers. Right. Mm -hmm. And all the big executive from the record company was coming out. All his mind was he wants the chili peppers, but he didn't get them. <laughs> you know what I mean? So he was hoping that our band was the chili peppers was going to be the next. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. wasn't, they were more like Van Halen, you know, with a better singer. And uh, he passed only because he was looking for the red, you know, another red, hot, the next red hot chili. So whenever a band would break like that band, every label was looking to sign their, you know, find that their version, you know what I mean? And that's what, you know, like the whole grunge thing, you know, there was a lot of grunge bands, but you know, one band, you know, one label, one band has a hit on a label. All the other labels are like, we want a grunt, we need a grunge band. You know what I mean? And the punk and all that stuff. So a little bit, was branding like that when, when one band would break all the brother record companies would you know look for that thing and that's why bands are so oh, we're gonna start sounding like these guys you know what i mean <laughs> and find, find a band and and so that that was a little bit of it when you know when bands would have success the record company just said well this is where our bread's gonna be buttered we gotta find it yeah so it wasn't all what they liked it was like what they thought you know, there was, and record companies were notoriously wrong. I mean, the, the, the bands they would sign would be so big. They could offset a lot of mistakes because <laughs> mm. they spend a lot, they'd send a lot of bands that went nowhere or whatever, you know, they were typical, typical corporate, you know, people, they didn't, you know, they didn't know who to hire and they didn't know a good band from a bad guy. And sometimes they got lucky. And, and don't forget the, the shelving practice where you, you, you sign a band that you think will be a competing a, a, a competitor for the artist that you're a big artist. You put them on the shelf. And you just you, yeah. You you just you 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 make the record and you just you don't promote it. You don't do anything, and then they I can't do guy, anything. I know some guys that happened to. I don't know why you know why they didn't get promoted, but I know some good bands that made some good records that never got you know anyway. Yeah. So yeah. All right, man. Well, it's been, it's been great, uh, rapping and catching up a little bit. Um, I'll have to, uh, <laughs> I'll have to, uh, do a better job of <laughs> not, not letting so many years go by. Um, and, uh, maybe I, I'm just so busy. I don't talk to my best friends. I'm just like, it's crazy. <laughs> 
Well, um, like I said, I'm, I'm saving my, my bottle caps and, uh, you'll, you'll get a, you, you'll get a call from me in, in not, in not too distant a future. Cause I have my eyes on one of those, uh, one of those, uh, private label guitars. Cool. Well, thanks for reaching out. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, God bless you. Have a good one. You too. Thanks, Sean. All right. Bye. Bye.